Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 93 of Libraries in Response. Uh, we're we're uh, back for what is effectively, actually, our uh, anniversary of four years in doing Libraries in Response. <laughs> so, uh, this is uh, anniversary special, and we're going to have an uh, interview with uh, Crosby Kemper. So we are the Gigabit Libraries Network, uh, technology-oriented group of librarians doing interesting things, exploring interesting uses for emerging technologies. Uh, our sessions are hosted and recorded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, our longtime ally in pursuit of public access in every community. And our sponsor for the series uh, this year is uh, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, who we thank very much. These are our been our sponsors for the for the series, the Internet Society, uh, IMLS, as I mentioned, the Library of Michigan. Uh, the New Jersey State Library and the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. Thank you all. And our media sponsors, the Library Journal and Broadband Breakfast, have been very helpful in helping spread the word and record these. Uh, that is to say, uh, write about them and help us uh, with outreach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we've used this <clears throat> this uh, metaphor for libraries is Swiss Army knife of public institutions for a long time, not a long time, maybe the last year or so. It occurred to us that it's difficult to describe, you know, the essence of libraries because they do so many things. And so the, uh, the Swiss Army knife is the closest thing we've been able to come up with that kind of captures the multiplicity of functions and services that libraries provide. Now, you're familiar that the Swiss Army knife has screwdrivers and corkscrews and knives and scissors and so forth, and that there are maybe better versions of those different tools. But uh, at the same time, uh, they're not in one place, like in your pocket. So that's the power of libraries is they have all these things that can match the needs of so many different people in so many different circumstances, more by far than any other kind of institution that does that. And also a very important, and to us, uh, kind of the core application is how they serve in uh, crisis response, crises that <clears throat> that occur from the individual level, regional to global. And we've covered some of that and explored it with uh, all these sessions that have happened since we started Four years ago at the at the dawn of the pandemic we've had nine thousand registrations uh to date surprises me i thought we were you know a little over half that but no i added it all up and that's how many we got and over 200 outstanding speakers and so that's been that's been really gratifying because we have all these recordings that are now uh captured and available for free view on the Libraries and Response YouTube channel. You can just search that and you'll find it. And we've had almost as many uh, video views after the fact as we have registrations. And over the last like 18 months, we've had almost double the number of views as registrations as the word is out that, uh, that these sessions are available. And as uh, people kind of search for things that I guess we're covering, uh, you know, there are tags related to the videos that uh to the sessions that uh uh cause people to find them so one reason or another it's great uh, that that's the case um uh, again this has been libraries responding to crisis crises a cascade of crises starting with COVID, of course when we were all freaking out about what it meant the building is closed so what is a library that was a question we posed in March of 2020, uh, having worked in um, how libraries can use various kinds of uh, wireless communication technologies to extend access to library Wi-Fi. 
which is the kind of the main thing that nearly all of us use. You know, of course, people go into the library and use their their machines to connect, but uh, the open access points that libraries have uh, are, are are extremely popular, as you would all know. So, what what now? The building, the library is closed, and many people rely totally on libraries for internet access, and then maybe more people than that. I mean, we're talking about tens of millions of people in the U.S uh rely on libraries for wi-fi and maybe it's maybe they have another source of it but it's more convenient it's faster maybe there's equipment there that uh, they need to use it's quiet whatever you know uh, people rely on this service but they have to go to one of the seventeen thousand facilities to access that service our view is that that service should be in every neighborhood it should be handily, it should be with like 10 minute walking distance and not just for uh, convenience to, you know, check your email uh, or, or your TikTok, but in case of uh, any kind of outages, disasters typically wipe out the telecom infrastructure. So having something powered up and open would be super valuable. The climate is the uh, pervasive uh, crisis that's uh, kind of eclipses everything else, and it's getting more intense and worse. But and that's one we're dealing with as well. Climate response here kind of falls into two categories. There's there's mitigation, which we've been talking about, of course, for a long time, is that how we can stop pouring more carbon and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. There's not a lot an individual library can do about that. I think there is an important role in showcasing sustainable technology. Having a, 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 a platinum green library just couldn't be a better service for the community to allow uh, people to see the actual technologies and how they work in their own community and, and you know, adopt it to the extent that, that local policy uh, is, what is important, but it's, it takes it on a mass scale. These are usually large governments that have to take care of this stuff. The other part of that is it's happening. It's real. It's inescapable. But so we have to deal with it. We would call this adaptation. And in this case, libraries, of course, can adapt. And at the front line, we all have to adapt at every level, individual, household, community. And libraries are an ideal situation to lead on adaptation strategies so that's our focus for primarily the response the latest crisis is ai this is a a, a a totally disruptive technology that's taken us over i mean it's analogous to COVID, and it's just kind of everywhere all at once but we don't really know what it is we don't really know what its impact is going to be we don't quite know what it means very much like COVID. But of course, it's uh, maybe not quite as immediately deadly, but we don't know over the long term whether it's actually as lethal as it, you know, as the pandemic might have been. And then, you know, we have this uh, political crisis, which hasn't hit us exactly, but, you know, we have had a social crisis with the, the Floyd murder and the backlash that we had an economic crisis and we had a political crisis uh, in January the 6th. So all these things are things that drive people, you know, to, uh, the, to the library for answers and comfort and so forth. So, um, these are the, these are the, this is a screen capture from the libraries and response YouTube channel where all of the 90 soon 93 sessions now 92 sessions have been posted for your available, uh, viewing and, so these are the most popular ones. Um, number six, session number six was, you know, early on, uh, probably would have been like in late spring of 2020. And we had librarians from Arizona and from Africa on about, you know, talking about what we were all talking about at the time. How, what are you doing? How are you dealing with responding to the, to the pandemic? And since then, I mean, I think we've maybe had a hundred people maybe for the session itself but now we've had a uh, we've had a thousand people look at it 
uh, over over the the three years since. And then the second most popular was uh, Corey Doctorow there with uh, nearly 500 views. Corey's a popular guy. And actually, we're having Corey back in May. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and then otherwise, the most popular sessions have involved uh, AI and understandably. So we're really going to do more of that. We have more of that planned. And I'll talk about what we've done so far. So the term for this kind of all these crises is polycrisis. This is a term I think it's a little over a year old. And it's not just that there are all these various crises in parallel, but they're actually interlocking. They're they're mutually reinforcing and they're making they're additive. They're making it all kind of more intense and, and worse. And this is our go-to image for that. And the the, the poor besieged world is longing for the good old days when you simply had to worry about nuclear annihilation. Our image or our thought for this particular illustration is that the world is surrounded by a network of 400,000 public libraries, which is the rough number that is estimated to exist in the world, that are all connected, all connected, of course, by, by the internet, and that are all more also connected through their work on various kinds of services and in their response to these various kinds of challenges. And that in doing so, it, it strengthens the response to uh, the challenge represented by these intense, severe, and major global crises. So this is a definition from the Cascade Institute. Uh, you know, there you have it. It's this entanglement is a, is a strange and complex thing that we're looking to dive more deeply into. Uh, COVID, yeah, that's what we got started about. And we're still talking about it because it's still with us, uh, primarily in the form of the impact of long COVID on tens of millions of people are still suffering from the impact of COVID. And they don't know actually what that is. They don't know how to... How to they don't have a cure for it. They don't even know, actually know what the phenomena is. It looks like this, but it's not quite, uh, you know, things that are, that are occurring on different kinds of uh, conditions. So, uh, but that was, that was really what brought us together in the first place. The climate change is the, is the big kahuna of crises. It really sort of shrinks every other kind of challenge that we've got. And uh, this is our collage of disaster here of uh, fires and floods and hurricanes and drought. It's, you know, it's just getting intense. And uh, last year was the hottest day on, hottest year on record. And it looks like 2024 is shaping up to be another one. Uh, they just, a few days ago, they recorded in Rio de Janeiro, 144 degrees Fahrenheit. I think it's 68 degrees Celsius. It's just a monstrous number. Uh, and and just not survivable for very long. Um, and I mean, of course, it's uh, Southern Hemisphere in the winter. It's, it's you know it's hot down there. So we're looking at challenges uh, dealing with this that are just defying humanity's ability to respond so far. <laughs> uh, so we just have to cope as best we can as individuals and as communities, and that's where libraries come in. AI has now hit the scene, whether that's going to compound our problems or maybe even provide a solution or a tool to, that we can use to respond to these various kinds of things. Uh, you know, health crisis, medical crisis, uh, unraveling some of these biological mysteries could be really, really valuable. Uh, but the question has been out, is it a boon or is it doom? And so people have their different positions on this and we'll just have to see, but we know it is a boom. Uh, it's landing on us. It's got everybody's attention in the last, you know, a little over a year. It's not that AI is new. It's just what's new is that this, an, it's become released as an end user tool. It's been used in back in internal embedded in systems uh, you know, automated uh, trading and financial markets, supply chain management, you know, all kinds of sophisticated uh, implementations, including 
uh, analyzing our individual online behavior and feeding us certain kinds of content for the advantage of uh, well advertisers and uh, people that serve advertisers. Uh, a special a Netflix that I would recommend to anybody, it's now two or three years old, it's called The Social Dilemma. And it talks about how we are being analyzed and fed certain kinds of information that cause us to click. And that this is encouraging certain kinds of behavior, which is more extreme than we might normally uh, otherwise do. Uh, so AI is what really drives that. It's a big open question about how we go from here. So we'll see. AI uh, first Thursday is our uh, day that we do uh, AI sessions. We'll have another one on April the 4th, first Thursday in April. Uh, we're going to have uh, a fellow named Pete Leiden, who is a, a Silicon Valley booster for AI. So most of the stories have been about doom and dread and and uh, the threat of AI. Uh, Pete will tell the optimistic side of that story, and hopefully we'll have a, a partner with him to uh, share that. These are the sessions we've done on AI. As I mentioned, it's been our most popular session or most popular topic. And I realize now we've done, I had no idea we actually did that many until I just looked it up. <laughs> and then uh, a few weeks ago, actually it was the 1st of February, uh, was the project launch for the state libraries and AI tools, Slate as it is, which uh, we are a partner with the University of Texas and 14 state library agencies to explore explore this technology and the, the implications that it has for the agency itself as a state agency and for the services it provides to uh, local libraries, especially the smaller rural libraries who don't have the kind of resources that you know New York Public and LA have, but have many of the same challenges and tools. And, and everybody is trying to figure out what this means that's, that's online because it's blending and spreading across the internet everywhere. So it's becoming the internet uh, itself. And what does that mean? Well, you know, that's a, that's an interesting question. No. So uh, stay with us on that. We've had a, a strong encouragement from, uh, and, and very appreciative uh, encouragement from friends uh, like Jen Nelson. Uh, this is just so appreciated, Jen. Uh, thank you again and again. Uh, John uh, at Shelby has been a supporter of this, and we appreciate their work and their support. Diane, uh, Diane is just emblematic of of uh, the innovation that's capable that smaller libraries are capable of. If someone is dedicated to superior service, if they're uh, tolerant to taking a certain amount of uh, risk and dealing with uncertainties to try out new things. Diane is your model. So we've just been so happy to work with her on projects and support her. Uh, and, and we wish her fantastic luck and thank her as we do Annie Norman at Delaware, who's been a, uh, uh, a, a visitor and a guest on, on libraries and response and uh, is one of the leading national librarians in the country. And we're, we're just so grateful to everybody that, that has been here for us. So now we are on to uh, our tribute to Crosby Kemper, who uh, unfortunately had a conflict today. He's in the air right now, traveling somewhere. So I had a chance to catch up with him yesterday. Uh, it was his last hour of his last day on the job as the director of, of IMLS. And he devoted it to us to give us his time and to reflect back on how he became, how he came to that job and what it was like to land at IMLS just as the pandemic was declared. He had to run that agency from his basement in Kansas City for the first two years. Uh, you know, thanks a lot. <laughs> Crosby, as you'll hear, 
uh, came from a long line of bankers in, in Kansas City uh, and was a banker himself until he decided he was interested in becoming the, the librarian of, of, of Kansas City, which they had a, at the time they had a law that said to be a library director in Kansas City, you have to actually be like a librarian. You need an I, uh, MLS degree. Well, he didn't have that background. And so they uh, they changed the law and he became the library director there for, I think, about 15 years. Did a great job and then gravitated towards uh, the, the policy scene in, in uh, Washington, D.C., around, around broadband, uh, partly as a result of the, the implementation of Google Fiber in Kansas City uh, in around 2008, I believe it was. And that... Uh, and that then led him over uh, to the federal agency, and he had no no experience with you know federal government. I mean, we all have some experience, but not running a federal agency. And so he took that on, so which is just an impressive. And his uh, his tenure has been a success. I think nearly everybody would say uh, the exceptions have been people criticizing the agency for uh, you know bad books and that whole story he talks about that so if you'll stay tuned uh we will hear from crosby and that will be our show for today uh come back next week we will have uh well we're going to kick off season five five years uh and we're going to talk about what's ahead and and we're going to invite you to tell us things that you'd like to see and so that'll be a highly interactive session and you'll be welcome to it. So thanks for four years. And well, let's make it five. That sign off. Thank you.